Welcome everybody back to Screenfish Radio. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here with some amazing people to talk about a really fun film to this week as we're talking about Jason Reitman's Saturday Night. And when you have a great cast of people like you do on Saturday Night Live, you need a great cast of people on your podcast. And I am very thrilled this week to have Tim Rideout, the creator of TheMindReels.com. Wow, that's me. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> can I be like the Dan Aykroyd? I feel like I'm more of like a Dan Aykroyd. Yeah. You, you, can, be, you, you can if you want. <laughs> um, I'll be Gilda Radner. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the host of In the Seats and friend, of course, both are friends to the show, but Dave Voigt, welcome back, David. Well, thanks for... Uh... Now, I'm happy to be here, too. I'm just happy to be here. Not only am I happy to be here, but I'm happy to be here. Wherever I am. Oh. Philosophy is too early in the morning for me. <laughs> a moment of say that in the afternoon, but Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, gentlemen, I would love to chat, but the show doesn't go on because it's ready. It goes on because it's 1130, as they say. So, for those of you at home, that do not know Saturday night is the, or is directed by Jason Reitman and takes us into the mid 1970s at a time of cultural chaos in the midst of Watergate, Vietnam and a changing world. America finds it's found itself at an emotional crossroads painted with fear. But in the midst of these trying times, Lauren Michaels and his team of not ready for primetime players were working towards something new tonight. They're about to unleash a new tele, a new live television program. That is the potential to speak for a generation. With the clock ticking down, Michaels tries desperately to hold things together because in 90 short minutes, they go live from New York. It's Saturday night. Gentlemen, I would love to hear what you thought of Saturday night. Oh, Dave, you're so much smarter than me. You go first. Oh, fair enough. All right. <laughs> uh, I'll take that compliment any day. That's fine. But, I, I, you know, honestly, I loved it. I mean, it's one of those things where... In telling the story, it could have very easily been sort of your standard biopic and sort of have it build up that way with behind the scenes and this, that, and the other. But in this film, it's it's 1001. Like we get dropped into the world, this world at 1001, go. And that's the fun of it. It's sort of the chaos and seeing sort of the the creative energy and sort of the 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 madness that that ensued sort of to build up to that moment. And it really sort of was a a, fan, a fascinating like capsule or capture of just uh, I guess the, at least to me the creative process because I mean again like you said at the top and I mean which is which is uh, and also it's been the, the motto for the show for years like it doesn't go on because it's ready it goes on because it's eleven thirty and that's just sort of the way it is sometimes I and mean, even in our business it's like you know we could rewrite and do whatever we want till the cows come home but you know sometimes you just have to go. Let it out into the universe and go start working on the next one. Yep. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. I loved it. I I liked I love the frenetic energy of the entire thing, just the way, like Dave said, you just get dropped into it. I love that they they don't compress the history so much, but all the things you expect to hear, like who came up with the not ready for primetime players kind of bit and and all that kind of and all the little history of all the people who were involved in the show. They kind of give you little nods and little hints and all this little background while still rushing you towards that 1130 deadline. So, yeah, it's it was great. And can I just get it out of the way really quick? I had no idea until the credits rolled that it was Dylan O'Brien playing Dan Aykroyd. Like he was channeling Aykroyd like I, he had that character down. I was stunned. <laughs> I was absolutely shocked by the these impersonations and it's funny like i guess this is one of the first one of the first times i was really conscious of the fact that you're impersonating people that are very much alive you know we you see films and somebody plays jimmy stewart and you're like oh that kind of reminds me of jimmy stewart that i've seen from clips or movies or stuff like that but like these are people who are not only alive but they're friends of the director right um, it's a lot of extra pressure like it's crazy to me to think that, you know, like Dylan O'Brien, I think was a highlight. Corey Michael Smith. Yeah. Is special in this as well. Um, his Chevy Chase is just like, <laughs> nuts. it's nuts. 
Um, I just had this completely meta thought, and it's probably out there already anyway, but they have this entire cast who's playing the SNL cast who are popular for playing other characters, like presidents and everything at the same time. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. Anyway, just cross through the transom of my mind. <laughs> you know, I, I agree with you both, too. I really love the, the way that they decided to do this. Now, I you know, Reitman has said it wasn't originally a Saturday Night Live movie. He wanted to do a real-time movie. That was how it, it started. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it evolved into this. But I was really glad it evolved into this because, I mean, this is SNL's 50th season. The tendency could have been for Lauren Michaels to pursue somebody who would like tell the origin story, if you will, and be, and, and almost put it up on a pedestal to be like this. And it is, it's an iconic show and continues to shift and change and be relevant. But like, it, this is just letting you see what it is as opposed to, you know, all the meetings. And he's like, oh, we'll never get this made. You know, the type of movie I'm thinking, yeah. like, it's just yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. almost deifying it. Like, it's this 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 holy sanctum of comedy. But instead, they're just like, you know what? This is the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love anything that kind of takes you behind the scenes of how something is done. So to kind of get that backstage look of, like, how hectic, not only the first show, but I'm sure every show since then has been. And anybody who loves live theater and stuff like that is like every anybody who's done theater can be like, I totally relate to this because you you just have to do it. And it's just so fun. And I and I love the fact you talked about the performances and so did we. But the fact that it's they are performances, they're not caricatures. They're not they walk a really fine line between doing an impression and a caricature. And it could have devolved into something that's not that's actually they're not reverential per se but they're definitely realistic i think in their portrayal well and i mean something else that comes through and i mean steve and i you and i were lucky enough to be in the room and talk with uh, jason Reitman about the film uh, he is emotionally invested in this you could tell from minute one like there is a genuine sort of care and emotion and emotional investment in sort of the project and how they did it, shooting it on film and just sort of the the frenetic nature of uh, the staging of it all through the rehearsals to even like the minutia of somebody like Jean Baptiste playing Billy Preston, kind of live scoring the film while he's on set doing it. And I mean, it was it was it really created this environment that I can imagine is probably as close as we're going to get to sort of that behind the scenes look on show night of Saturday night live because it was just frenetic. It was insane, but it was, it was joyful all at the same time. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was definitely, you're not like, you you definitely buy into the tension, but yes, it's frenetic and it's fun. Like it's just so much fun. You kind of want to do that yourself or not like this. (laughs) But yeah, it's wild to think like they, like, you know, they talked about the way he he staged it. Like he's telling actors to keep talking, even if they're off camera, because he wanted it to feel like there's all these conversations happening and you're just wheeling around it. Uh, and it was interesting because I actually thought watching it, I thought this almost feels, I, I want to say it feels like the show. And I don't mean the energy of the show. I mean, in some ways it it plays out like a series of vignettes, like a series of short skits. And I, I mean that to its benefit because yeah. they're not like they're, they're completely flows and it's, and it's gen- but like, you know, for example, the thing, the, the young Billy Crystal, uh, whoever, who was playing the young Billy Crystal? Oh man, it was, I've got it up right here on IMDb because I forgot all the amazing people who are in this thing. It's nuts. It's crazy. Uh, no, I- but I can't find it. But any, anyway, the, the young, the young person who was playing Billy Crystal and it's like this is this is a short scene, and you, you know they're arguing, and it has it even had a punch at the end, and then they move to the next bit, and they're like, and, and the film was a collection of characters, but not caricatures, like you said. Um, and I thought that was really, I thought that was a really interesting way to build it. There's a certain like chaos. I don't know. I, I would love to know if you guys felt like I did. Did anybody else feel like Gabriel LaBelle? Because I felt like he was having the least amount of fun of everybody on that <laughs> screen. 
Yeah, yeah. He's, he just looks like he's not, he's definitely stressed, but he does it so well. And again, this he had Lauren down so well that again, at the end of the movie, I'm pulling up my IMDb. I'm like, wait, this is the kid from the Fablemans? I just like, holy crap. I mean, he, yeah, he was fantastic. And he's just so wound up and everything. He just wants it to be right. And I love how much he wanted to put into the show. Like when you see the act breaks and like, he's got all the cards on the board and he wants everything in the show. And they're like, you, Lauren, you have to cut, you have to cut, you have to cut, but he wants it all there. He's so passionate about it. And I think if he hadn't had that little break halfway through, he would have gone really over the bend. Yeah. Yeah. He's fantastic. I love everybody in this movie. I'm just a cheerleader now for this movie. I have nothing critical to say. I am, I'm of no use in this conversation. <laughs> But I mean, I think it really does speak to the idea, or at least even the spirit of 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 Saturday Night Live. I mean, as much as people will pull out stars from it, this is about as pure of an ensemble piece as as we're going to get in cinema. There is no lead. I mean, as much as 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 we're as we're following Lauren and following Gabriel, you're hard pressed to say who the lead in this film is. No, that's totally fair. And I love that. I love that everybody gets a chance to shine. I mean, everybody gets their moment. I mean, and J.K. Simmons as Milton Berle. Oh, my God. Oh. That was <laughs> yeah. You know, in keeping with that idea, you know, what things I, I'm looking at the I'm just looking at the cast on on Google right now as we're chatting. I think this uh, I, I know everybody in this film has an in, incredible IMD page. IMDb page, if you will, of it. but it is kind of cool to look at it and see that they're not selling the movie based on its cast per se. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like this is the, you know, this is, this is a Brad Pitt movie. Oh, and all these other people are in it. Like you said, talk about being an ensemble piece, like Corey Michael Smith, who I will talk about forever um, in this movie because I loved him. And, but I know him as the Riddler in Gotham, which most people I talk to, they're like, I didn't even see that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's like this dark comedy in that character, too. And he, he's got it here. And I'm like, this this cast is young people who are still just starting out, even if even if they've been around for a long time, like or been in high profile things like Gabriel LaBelle was in The Fableman. Dylan O'Brien's been around. Finn Wolfhard. Who, yeah. <laughs> who is just the guy on the street <laughs> like filmed it on his lunch hour probably i don't know right and even go deeper than that like cooper, cooper hoffman is dick ebersol i mean nicholas braun is doing double duty just because he can yeah yeah oh so much fun such a great cast it's an incredibly incredibly talented cast i think it's really and and it really but but because they're not the major names you you can almost i think it's easier to just sort of let them be absorbed into these other characters as well um, yeah yeah there might not have been a lot of ego on set i would hope not yeah which, which is weird because of all the stories you hear about behind the scenes at saturday night live where there were egos on set yeah yeah, yeah. and i mean matthew rice showing up as george carlin i mean you know tracy letts was in this God, movie. yeah like, it. you know it's like it's it's amazing yeah yeah. Uh, yeah. Another actor. I'm like, I walked out of the theater. And I'm like, oh my God, that's the guy from the Americans and Perry Mason. And yeah, I'm like, what? <laughs> Just, yeah. Hits all around for this cast. I love it. I do hope that people pick it up that aren't that, that or this may sound like a strange comment, but I do hope that people aren't dissuaded by it as a Saturday Night Live movie, because some people I've, I've talked to some people. I'm like, did you see it? They're like, I don't really like Saturday Night Live. Like, but that's not what this is. Yeah. Um, it's it's bigger than. I mean, th we're talking about this incredible cast and they're incredible, you know, bringing these these icons to life. But it's more than that. You can enjoy it just as a straight up comedy wild ride at the same time. Oh hell yeah! Yeah. But, but I mean, also it is it's this pivot point in pop culture where everything changed. Yeah. And that is like you like the show or not like the show. It's undeniable that what saturday night live did initially and i mean let's let's face it those first couple of years were rough that almost didn't survive i mean even lauren went away for a year until he came back and then it really started to find distraction it's it's not like saturday night live came out of the gate 
this 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 massive hit. It, it stumbled. It tripped. It's uh, it, it took time to find itself. But I think the realities of what this did to the pop culture landscape as a whole it, it is undeniable. I mean, are there half of the min of the late night talk shows that we have, if not for some of these, uh, for a show like this? Because I mean, let's think about it. While you know Johnny and Johnny and Ed McMahon did the occasional skit, mostly it was just straight up them at the desk. Ed Sullivan was just him at the desk. This brought in bits to bits to to, to late night comedy. Yeah. Well, one, and one of the biggest names in late night comedy is a former cast member from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> like you know, these writers. Well, I mean, even O'Brien didn't. O'Brien, did O'Brien ever write for them? I know he brought O'Brien wrote for The Simpsons. Oh no, Conan O'Brien wrote for Saturday Night Live. He did yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, and Seth, of course, Seth. And, uh, so you've got Seth. <laughs> and, uh, no, but I mean, like Seth, Conan O'Brien, Tina Fey. I mean, like the amount of people that have come out of that machine is staggering. Yeah, it's wild. You, it, 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 and you talk about that, and this film sort of puts that on because we see what a variety show looked like before, right? They give you a taste of of Uncle yeah. Milty, uh, too much of Uncle. <laughs> yes, <laughs> parts of Uncle Milty you can't unsee. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even with someone like uh, Chevy and Corey and Michael Smith, I mean, I love that they were planting the seeds of the reality that, you know, let's not. Chevy lasted a season barely. Yeah, was he only on that briefly? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. I did, I he knew was he was already looking for his way out, like the second he was there. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize he was that brief. I knew he was brief, like, but I thought he was three years, maybe four. Because I thought, didn't he lasted longer than Murray, didn't he? Or was it the other way around? No, Bill Murray replaced replaced Chevy. Okay, I didn't realize that. Okay. Um, I mean, Bill didn't last that long either, but it's you know. No, 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 no. That opens opens the whole can of worms of. Shit. Well, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. That's another podcast for another day, okay. for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> still glowing about the film. We're still glowing about no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I I just wanted. I mean, this is way off topic. Well, not necessarily. It's so on topic. I'm just kind of curious who your guys. SNL cast was growing because I didn't come to it till like the 90s so my guys are like Mike Myers and Phil Hartman and Dana Carvey and before that I kind of eh, it was okay and then after that I was kind of like no it's not for me anymore so I wonder if it's a generational thing or if you just if it just resonates to a certain at a certain time I think it does have its sort of generational moments because I mean I, I'm with you I mean I really didn't sort of start to embrace it until sort of that late 80s, early 90s when when Lauren came back. Because, I mean, Lauren started it and then, like, from basically from the early 80s, he wasn't around. And then, then they had to bring him back and then it really started to hit when, you know, it was Dana Carvey and, and Phil Hartman and then they, they, they would discover uh, Farley and Sandler and yeah. Schneider. Yeah, Chris Rock and those guys, and those guys would start to evolve out of that era. And I mean, you know, with like the Tina Fey's and the Will Ferrells, and those people coming sort of out of all that. It did yeah. like the show didn't really, at least for me, the show never sort of clicked. Mm -hmm. so I think it clicked with all of us. Yeah, I I I was in nineties. I was I hopped on in the nineties again because my friends were watching it. I was like. You know, and and you know, I was maybe thirteen when Wayne's World came out, but my friends were talking about Wayne's World, and I'd seen some clips. You know, I guess the I VHS recordings and stuff yeah. like that, because <laughs> certainly didn't see it on YouTube. Um, but you know, that was sort of my first one. But it is interesting; like it, it goes through waves, right? Like after that, after that era. 
you know, it, it really did lull back down again. Like nobody talks about the Jim Brewer years and that's no hatred of Jim Brewer, but I'm just like, he's like of all the SNL cast, like he's, there were, there were years where cast was not as well beloved as, as others. And then it picked up again, the late nine, is it the late nineties would be feral, the the start of the feral years. I would say mid. Yeah. 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 And then the early in it, in it, in it, you know, those ones move on and they come up again. And, you know, it, it really is wild how it, how it seems to go in waves and it mm-hmm. seems to be on an upturn again, I would say like, it just goes this way. And then they make fun of it, not being funny in the middle of it. And people like that they do that. Right. <laughs> um, but I will say, I will say this. So I, I made, when I, what I did start my par- my parents, when we would go on vacation to Florida, um, I discovered Nick at night, the channel Nick at night, which we didn't have up here. So I would, I would watch these old episodes with, you know, like land shark, I thought was the funniest thing in the world at the age of nine was like the funniest. I was so happy. There was a land shark that went across the screen in this. Yes. Was like, that, that's my <laughs> shit right there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I like, I, I love those old episodes, the ones I saw, but I didn't really understand them because some of the skits, are really like heady in the seventies, those early years. Um, but uh, no, I yeah, I would say I would say it was the nineties was was when I started. Uh, I don't know who who would your lineup be if you had to pick a lineup of five cross Ooh. generations. Who would you pick? Oh my god, that is a good question. Phil Hartman for sure has got to be in there. I miss Phil. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I'd throw in Mike Myers, uh, Bill Murray, um, Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Well, that leaves me with one more, doesn't it? Gilda. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Dave, what about you? Uh, there's some crossover. I mean, I'd put Eddie in for sure. Uh, I can't not put Tina Fey in just because I love her to death. <laughs> yeah. Bill Hartman. Uh, Mike Myers. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, I'd probably go Ackroyd. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I would I would go a little newer. I think I'd go with Farrell. I'd have Farrell on there as well. I love I absolutely loved Farrell. Uh Tina Fey for sure. Um Eddie Murphy. Um oh man. Right. There's it, so many. It really is a murderer's row. Like it's crazy of these. Uh, I, I, I'd even slide Sandler in there. Although Sandler wasn't really great, he didn't have great skits, but he was great when they used him. Like his his update stuff was awesome. Um, <laughs> I'd even show some love to Andy Samberg because of his uh, because of the oh I forget the group that they would do the the Lonely Island bit. Right, so, right. That that changed the show. That changed the show because that was right on the cusp of the YouTube YouTube era. Granted, they had been doing short films and other stuff sort of on top of that. Like Albert Brooks had been directing short films. Yeah. And, like it wasn't entirely unheard of, but the digital age did sort of make it a bit more widely accepted and a bit more, it, it gave it a bit more of a platform. That's yeah. that's undeniable. But I mean, it's funny. I'm going through the, the cast list now, like all time. And I mean to see that you know, you know Julia Louis Dreyfus was there for three years. Yeah. You know, uh, you know Robert Downey Jr. was there for a season. Um, Christopher Guest. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and we forget like we forget of some of these sort of, you know, like the Rachel Dratches and the Nora Duns and yeah. you know, like right. some of these like really fantastic talents who who were there and i mean some are still there i mean you know you don't think of colin yost being on snl for 12 years but there he has been oh my god i didn't know that yeah, yeah. kate mckinnon you know. oh yeah yeah that's wild love it i love it oh big boy big stretch so stretch. so here i mean this is interesting because you sort of tapped into this dave when you talked when you talked about you know giving a new platform 
uh, in the YouTube era. I, I love that this show highlight or this film highlights, or I'm still calling it a show. The film highlights the fact that this is, uh, there's never been a television show made by the generation that grew up on television. And I would love to hear from you both your thoughts on that, because that's an interesting observation for a show like this. You, you know, they were that, you know, those mid 1970s, I guess TV really did take over in the, in the 1950s. So they're the ones that are finally piloting the ship. What, Mm. how did that impact it in your mind? Oh man. I could just start throwing out word salad now while Dave thinks, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I would, in many ways, it's, it's one of those things that I think a lot of it is also born out of, especially what was happening in New York in the seventies with sort of the filmmaking that was coming up and the comedy that was coming up. I mean, there are so, there is so much connective tissue between obviously uh, Saturday Night Live and, and National Lampoons and sort of the stuff that happened there and how all that evolved, but also in terms of what a melting pot it was, like, especially at that, in that day and age, you didn't necessarily go to, la to to be creative you went to la to try to get us you know a spot on uh on vegas with the uh, you know robert urich and you know that kind of stuff and it really wasn't sort of the the uh the mecca of creativity it, like at that day and age it was new york and i mean i think this with this show is the first time that mass audiences on television on network television got to see sort of that crazy, unhinged, unbridled creativity that was coming out of that generation of performers. Wow. Yeah, okay, I'm done. Uh, I have nothing to follow up on. Word salad. (laughs) No, no, but I mean, like, when you think about it, honestly, like, as much as we don't necessarily equate it, you know, the, the Aykroyds and the Belushis and the Chevy Chases and the Bill Murrays were coming up kind of around the same time as the Pacinos and the De Niro's and the Joe and the you know and the Casales and the Joe Pesci's and and the Scorsese's and all these kind of people like it wasn't all that different but it was different because these were the these were the comedy these were the comics these were the funny guys the dramatic people the the artists as it were you know got to go make their films and go to con and do this and be accepted the weirdos who were telling fart jokes weren't necessarily being accepted until Lampoon, until a lot of that evolved from the radio shows that they were doing to Saturday Night Live. You word know, salad, salad, word salad. Right, right yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that's the first time I've ever thought of the two eras at the same time. It did. I, it seems like a dumb thing to say. I admit it. But I don't think I occurred to me. It occurred to me that a guy like, you know, Pacino was coming up mm. at the same time as as this. Like, I mean, granted, he was a little more a stat. Like he was making, you know, he was at his peak doing you know, dog and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. But they're not that separate as we think they are. Hmm. I like the idea that, you know, for the first time, like we said, you know, they this was the generation that grew up on television. So they're young, they're, they're impudent, they're irreverent and they're making television. Whereas every other show on the air at that time, uh, like, well, you mentioned Vegas and, and, you know, chips and everything. It was all very formulaic. Everything was episode, everything reset. You know, you'd have a story, it would reset at the end of the episode. So you could tune in or not tune in each week and everything would be the same. This is the first time that people are starting to see, people who start to look, you know, look people you can relate to people that look like you, you know, Joe average, you know, you're not a stunning, good looking fella, like whomever you're, you know, you could be an actor, you could be a Bill Murray, you could be, you know, and there you are on screen being funny, doing things. And I think that opened the imagination for a lot of people. And it was a different kind of television because it's, it's live. Like we said, it's, it's, it's happening now. Whereas episodic television, you don't need to 
watch it. You could read the TV guide blurb, but if you missed Saturday Night Live, then you didn't get to see it again until later years with VHS and, and DVDs. It was... Yeah. And it really did come out of an era as well of... Like, not necessarily... Because, I mean, when you think of sort of the stand-up sort of world at this time, the Carlins and, and, and so many other people that were going on and the, and the Ruby Ray Moores and sort of releasing their own albums and doing their own thing. This was an evolution. Like, this was a combination of people who wanted to be in theater but also wanted to to do the comedy. This was, so, to me, this was the hybrid of the people who wanted to be on Broadway but also tell jokes. Because mm -hmm. then, this is not something that you did. Like, Carlin was not doing a run on Broadway. You know, Rudy Ray Moore was not, uh, you know, he was not doing a... Uh, you know, an evening at Carnegie Hall kind of thing. Fair. This is sort of the the foul mouth, the irreverent, married to the the people who wanted to be theater kids. Nice. Mm. And, and you think about word salad, energy. word salad, word salad. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you think about the energy of the era too. I think that's that's one of the interesting things about this piece, like. You know, when we think about 20th century history, one of the eras we immediately think of when we think of significant time periods is that mid 60s to mid 70s time of transition and change, you know, peaking at peaking at Woodstock and well, not I mean, the, you've got time of social change, you've got, uh, you know, everything, everything is shifting so quickly. And you've got these kids that have come out of that. I almost think it, maybe that's the, I, I was thinking about this too, the impact of them being on, you know, the generation raised on television. They saw it. They didn't just see it, you know, they, they didn't just, you know, see it when they were there. They saw it live. They saw it happening. They saw I, the, I have a dream speech. They saw at which I should say, yeah, Woodstock isn't necessarily the peak of culture. That's not what I'm saying, but it is one of these tectonic sure. moments. But certainly the I Have a Dream speech was there and they saw it live. It didn't matter if you lived in the Midwest or if you lived in Florida, you could see these things. You saw the world shifting. Um, and that's got to play in. Like there, there's a fury in the way that they bring their comedy or the way that they brought their comedy in that one. I'm not saying it was, it's been like that the whole show, but certainly at that, at that time, you know, that that they embedded into this this program, which I think is really interesting. And I think steps out of that. They're they're watching clips of the Vietnam War. People in the 50s weren't necessarily watching that. I'm not saying I can't say that they were for weren't for sure, but not in the same way. Like they're getting newsreels. Um, but not not that generation. It's it's really interesting. And now I think we see it again because social media has changed the way that we consume information right like it's sort of yeah yeah it's interesting it's interesting i mean in many ways what this era of saturday night live was almost it was almost an introduction of the counterculture to the masses yeah yeah and comedy therein and sort of how you can look at the world and have a laugh at it and and do certain things with it where it's evolved to now is it's it's almost and I mean, I don't mean this in a negative way. It's almost evolved to the point where we're so inundated with stuff that it's 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 hard to find the culture. Mm -hmm. If that makes any kind of sense, because it's not a question of you know people are you know we all get sucked into a you know, real doom scroll every once in a while looking at videos and whatnot, but it's not necessarily born of saying something if that makes any sense it really is just a born out of sort of a glut of entertainment this was an era where they were being funny and doing stupid shit pardon my french but they were saying something at the same time saturday night live with all of its ebbs and flows still manages to say something and even the artists who have managed to come out of it in their 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 various sort of iterations have all been comedians and actors of various degrees who still managed to sort of say something. Because, I mean, like we were saying earlier, like when you go through the entire cast list, 
Like, as much as there are a few names where it's like, who, what? It's like, oh, then it's a murderer's row. And it's like, oh, yeah, Michael McKeon was there for two years. You know, Mark McKinney, you know, can, you know, jumped from uh, kids in the hall to 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 there for a few years. I mean, it's there's such a a plethora of performers who've walked across that stage and, and changed modern pop culture. Uh, I mean, I definitely think for the better, because I mean, in many ways, do we get the Daily Show without Weekend Update? Do we get? Uh, I mean, I could, I'm sure I could list off a few of the things, but this show allowed the freedom to be dumb, but also to be the freedom to say something at the same time. Um, yeah. They sort of popped that in the film a little bit too, where you got the writer's room trying to argue against <laughs> standards and practices. Yeah. Yeah. Bad. With the I am Spartacus theme, I am Satan. No, I am Satan. I was, I was laughing. I'm like, this mm -hmm. is great. This is so good. Um, yeah, I think I think what Dave said is right. It, like it lets them, and it also I think let the public look at politics in a new way, because you know they could be made fun of. I mean, yeah, you could read the New Yorker or whatever, and there would occasionally be the satiric piece, but for the general masses, most of them at that point, I think, for the count, except excluding the counterculture, was very much still. The government is good and and politics are you know and and relations between you know dems and, and republicans were fine and and this kind of showed that yeah you can laugh at both sides you're just you know you have to have a sense of humor about it and i think that was a first for that generation because like we said they've been raised on television they they had this better view of things going on that they could just, just say well this is stupid I mean, Luke O'Donoghue was a notorious shit disturber back in the day, and I mean, just I to have it. him on those early, you know, sessions was is kind of why why it worked, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah it's so fun. It's word so salad, word salad, salad, word salad, okay. <laughs> word salad. Okay. Word salad. I'll have a bowl of word salad, please. Yes. Um, it, it's wild to think of it as a time, like looking back, that the television likely wasn't as critical in the of like comedy certainly was or at least not on on television wasn't as critical of things like you know war or or you know injustice or these sorts of things because that's an interesting point tim like you're right like they like you're looking back at this uncle milty and he's out there with these these beautiful girls and he's doing a little dance and he's winking at the camera and it's like hey everything's fine folks um but they they come out of the gate with a joke about killing a guy on stage with the you know the first bit that they show and it's like that you know it, it almost I, I and maybe in some ways i can't speak to the era of course that uh wasn't my era but i can't speak to it but like maybe in some ways it, it, that's this is one of the things that gave people permission to realize how insane things truly are with a bit of a smirk if you will or a bit of a laugh mm -hmm. Um, I would think so, or at least that. Yeah, that's kind of the way I felt about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, how? Well, why is it that even in this day and age, we're probably more culturally, socially, politically aware than maybe we have been in years past? Is because we're getting a lot of it through laughter, and we're getting it explained mm -hmm. to us through laughter. You know, The Daily Show is not news. What these other people is not news. But it allows us to disseminate and understand and go to the news with at least a bit more of a an understanding of the broader picture of, of both sides of the argument and, and see how those things evolve. Oh, that's totally fair. Yeah, because honestly, before I ever got into The Daily Show and the Colbert Report and all that kind of stuff. I Weekend Update would be where I would kind of get my news. And then if something caught my interest, then I would go and explore it. And yeah. Colbert and, and Daily have kind of filled that void for me. And I will, I find myself listening to the shows and, and running down news items that they talk about, or, you know, finding myself involved a little more in researching Canadian politics just because of things I've heard. So yeah, I think Dave's right. If, 
if they can hook you with laughter and then educate you in some way, then that's, that can be a really good thing or get you more involved. Maybe not necessarily educate you more, but if they can make you laugh to hook you in to be more involved, that can be a really good thing. And, and you know, I'll even, I'll even uh, add to, add to that with this in some ways, I think this is a testament to where the show is now. A lot of times I think people are looking for the show to translate those things. They, it's not even, sometimes it's things that they don't know. Like I didn't, you know, this week's episode, they're talking about, you know, uh, problems going on with the mayor of New York. I had no idea there were things going on with the mayor of New York, but I'm thinking specifically back to Trump's run in 2016. And it was so, so monumental that people would look to Saturday Night Live and Alec Baldwin's portrayal of him to help yeah. deal with it. Like, it was like, this is be our voice in, in this moment and, 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 try and make sense of this for us by laughing at it. It was, it was it, like that. There are moments like that throughout the show's run where, where you realize the show takes on an extra level of political power, right? It's, it's really interesting. I mean, you can go back further with the Tina Fey and Sarah Palin and, you know, and, and oh, yeah. his Bush iterations and the willingness of the older cast to come back when the politics or sort of what's happening in the world dictates something has been monumental. I mean, you know, if Kamala Harris wins, you know, Maya Rudolph's going to be sticking around for a bit, you know, Andy's going to go down the street playing the first husband a bit, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just one of those things to see how Saturday night live has evolved into something that was bigger than even I'm sure Lauren would have imagined back during this initial run which, you know, obviously we got to see recreated in some way, shape, or form via Saturday Night the Film. Yeah, you know what's funny is I just realized we're talking about this. And we're, we've moved beyond this. <laughs> My we're fault. just talking about legacy. <laughs> but I think that's part of the, like, that's part of the magic of this film. Like, it really is. It's because it reminds you of, of the starting pistol, if you will. Yeah. That, you know, like... You know, my my kids have seen some Saturday Night Live skits, but Anders is Anders is getting to be a teenager, and you know it's going to happen. I'm sure at some point that it'll 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 become a thing for him too. Like it'll they'll be they'll be his players, if you will. Like this is one of those things I just want to keep going. Uh, no, but I mean, also it, it speaks to the need, especially in sort of the modern TikTokified landscape of knowing like being able to know and appreciate our history you know there yeah. was this thing called saturday night live it was important there was this film called citizen kane it was important no it wasn't spelled with a k you can see it was spelled with a k you know it's one of those things where you have to be able to being able to appreciate history is absolutely vital especially in sort of the milieu that we're working in. And I mean, I don't want to sound holier than that one when we say this, but it's so important to not forget about this stuff and to be able to educate ourselves and other people about that stuff as well. I mean, I think what this film does is just reminds sort of uh, the, the, the pop culture landscape that uh, yeah, somebody did it before them, you know, this is where it started. This is where the ball got rolling, appreciate it, love yeah. it. And then just go from there. And will I say one auto, one accidental typo on Instagram and you're still not letting me go. <laughs> I am never letting that go. I am never letting that go. When, uh, it's, you know, all right. Anyway, uh, it's my job to make sure you never let it go. I know. Anyway, um, that's not holier than thou at all. No, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. No way. I am your teacher. You are my bad one. <laughs> no, to spell it. Anyway, that's. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I want to reel it back to the movie for just a moment. <laughs> um, but one of the things I love about this movie, we talked about it a little bit, is the chaos. And I mean, this is a show that is notorious for chaos. And, you know, the even even Reitman, when he's talking about making this movie, he, I, you know, in this interview that we, we got to sit around the round table, he said, eventually he just had to submit to Saturday Night Live when he's shooting this thing because of all the chaos going on around him. So my question is about control. Do you think you can ever really have control 
about whether it, you know, whether it's in creation of something or of work or anything. I, yeah, however you want to answer that. Mm. I have no control over how you answer. So I think, okay. I think there's a dual answer there because I think with work, yes, there can be control. But I think when it comes to creation, uh, whether it be, you know, an art piece or even just a post that one of us writes, um, there's always going to be chaos because there's what you plan for it, what you've done with it, and then you release it. But then it's not yours anymore. And that's when it spins into chaos because then it gets interpreted. It gets, you know, it can get shared. It can be seen in different by a different perspective. Um, and chaos in that situation is probably a good thing. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of a macro scale, control can't exist. I don't think it can. Control is an illusion. Control is an illusion. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, even on on, a, on such a smaller scale uh, of what you're doing, Tim, and what guys like Steve and I are doing on our sites, we can steer the ship. We can sort of, we can angle the hurricane where we need it to go sometimes. <laughs> But we can't, you know, we can't slap the reins on it and so and tell it to slow down or stop or do this or do that. Like with the, even in this industry, it's like this industry, if everyone thinks there's control in this industry, that's laughable. I'm sorry, but there is not. I mean, this to me is such a perfect encapsulation of the entertainment industry as a whole. Because even from us, from a movie standpoint, it's like as little as five years ago we did not live in a world where a studio could pick up a movie on a monday send us a press release on a tuesday and be, have it released in theaters on a friday that happens now and it happens a lot yeah the butterflies not the hurricane exactly yeah okay. <laughs> i just want to make sure i follow <laughs> <laughs> your ears well, depends how it uh, depends how the rest of this episode goes tim really is <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I, so it's, it's, like, it's like i always joke with steve whenever we're working on stuff it's like oh, i gotta catch up i gotta catch up it's like you're never gonna be caught up no. that's the point I still think there are markers you can hit, but <laughs> yeah, but then they keep moving the goalpost. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is devolved into a podcast and me making fun of Steve, but that's another story entirely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so go home, plug in your copy of Citizen Kane with a C. Oh no! And... Yeah, is that now? Would that be? Could you that's find the that Christmas the version? Time? Like with Citizen Kane, you could find that on Pornhub with a key with the C. So probably, yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> Rosebud takes on a whole new meaning there. Oh, yeah. Hello, <laughs> hi oh Tim will be here all week, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes, I know it's Kane with a K. Our... <laughs> his name, his first name starts with C. All right, it's just, uh, but anyway. Charles, um, but you know what? I, I think it's true. I think I think there's a dual double edged sword with the idea. We, you talk about control, like a show like this. They just sort of set up the dominoes and see what happens. Like how many times, how much magic has been made by things that went wrong? Like how many things have gone viral because a person breaks or something goes wrong in it? That I mean, not doesn't harm anybody, but that you know, someone falls over that doesn't supposed to. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like I mean, even on even on that show, you know, Elvis Costello stops mid set and changes songs and just sings something he's not supposed to. Sinead O'Connor tears up a picture yeah. of the Pope on live TV. It happens all the time. I remember that happening. Yeah, me too. Oh, my word! Nowadays, that would be tame. Um, or would it? I, I wonder how that would translate in twenty twenty four. That was a huge thing. Yeah, 
was that not like 91 or something like that like it feels like 91. I knew I was in Halifax at the time. So it was yeah, 91, been... 92, something like that. Yeah. It was in those early years. Yeah, it was right when Sinead was getting big. So, yeah. 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 Um, it's it's wild. Or or was it um, Ashley Simpson? Ashley Simpson? Yeah. Was, oh. was it her? Yeah. Lip syncing on air? Was that? Yeah. Was that her? Oh, yeah. yeah. That was huge. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's some there's a certain thing about live, just live TV in general. Even I mean, Fallon the- broke more than he than he performed, and he got the Tonight <laughs> Show. You know what I mean? It's like half of his career was breaking on Saturday Night Live. But like we just we never really have control. We think we do. I think I think Dave's right. I think it's illusion. Doesn't matter. It, even you know, you get a phone call that you don't want. Or something like that, and and it and it breaks. I think I think it's interesting, and this show sort of puts it on trial every week, from eleven thirty to one in the morning. Um, you know, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing. There's something magical about live. You know, if they ever just decide to record it, it wouldn't be the same. Because with live, you have that possibility that anything could happen. It's it's wild. It's wild. There's something there's something about being live and that lack of control that I think is sort of magical about about this. Uh, when the crowd tells you what they want, they're gonna that you just have to sort of pivot that way. If SNL was giving sort of these staunch, sort of you know, very I'm trying to figure out the right word, but I mean basically not what the audience was looking for if they were doing like 40 minutes of fart jokes and, you know like okay you can have five minutes of fart jokes but if you're doing 40 minutes of fart jokes we're gonna blow you off the stage you know give us something else can you do it in two <laughs> right <laughs> i can do it in two <laughs> see you billy <laughs> and you know it's interesting because that was like the sandler generation too was like that was what they were known for they weren't they they were called the yeah. bad or the bad the the yeah, bad because yeah, yeah. they were they were the ones that just leaned all in into like the you know it's not like it's not like the the humor wasn't satirical before but they're just like yeah we're gonna give you fart jokes Sandler has made that. hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars doing stupid stupid shit yes it's... I mean Happy Gilmore is shoot Happy Gilmore two is shooting right now and I'm going to see it <laughs> and so am I. <laughs> That means I don't have to then, right? Yeah, you're good. You're good. You're good. <laughs> we see bad movies, so you don't have to, as they say. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, you know what, uh, gentlemen? Honestly, like this is this has been a ton of fun, and I love chatting with you both. But we should screen it or skip it. <laughs> Saturday night, screen it or skip it. Oh, it, it's a screen. It. It's, it is a, I don't want to call it a biopic. I don't want to call it a slice of history. It is, it is to me sort of an, an encapsulation of the energy of not just what it means to, to do live performance, but to, to, to do something that's going to change the way we consume pop culture. This was sort of that impetus, that sort of breakout moment for so many other things to come. Oh. I was just gonna say screen it. <laughs> but no, this this one was, yeah, I love this one so much. Um, and like you guys said earlier, it, you don't even have to love Saturday Night Live. It's just a great, it's an entertaining and funny film. Um, I said in my little write-up that I think it's arguably Reitman's best film. Um, to date, I would just, agree with that. Yeah. yeah, he's firing on all thrusters here. It's got a great story, great performances, and it's just it's fun. You want to be thrown into that chaos and energy and just see how it rides out. And every member of the cast gets this chance to shine, and it's just everything works. Everything works in this film. It's just damned enjoyable. And, and that's the thing. That's that's. That, I'm glad you brought that up with about Jason Reitman because. It is one. Of, I think it is one of his best works. And I mean, I think throughout the history of his canon, 
when you can you can tell when he's emotionally invested in something, and he's definitely emotionally invested in this. Like he's a, he's a competent filmmaker. You know, the Ghostbuster movies were fine. This he is emotionally invested in. This is a different kind of movie. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's interesting you said that, Tim, because I know we sort of talked about it before. But that would be my question: Would you say? Would you still say screen it to somebody who doesn't like watching SNL? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you don't have to like SNL. No, I you mean, don't. It's not. It does. Yeah, it's not built that way. No. It's it's just fun and funny and damned entertaining. Like, and it just, it works. There's nothing in this film. There's no dead air in this film. Mm. Every scene is important. Everything moves the story along. Everything moves the characters along. It's, yeah, I loved it. Because I mean, really, when you think about it, this film doesn't hinge on whether you like SNL or not. It hinges on sort of the acknowledgement that you kind of have to respect what it is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go with skip it. Uh, no. <laughs> Just to be controversial. We're live, right? So no. anything can happen. Anything can happen. No, I. it's phenomenal. It is such a fun ride. And um, it it is. But it, but it still carries you. Like I said, like it, it may like there are all these multiple stories going along. Um, but each one of them feels like it matters for different reasons. And I think it's, it's, and it's a ton of fun. Uh, there are tons of deep cut Easter eggs in it. If you're an SNL, if you are an SNL fan, I have to also say too, I didn't say this before. My favorite thing I saw was a box of coal and blow that they don't even mention. And I'm like that, that was my Phil Hartman skit. I laugh. I still laugh at his commercial for coal and blow. Um, which is so good. Um, they're eating out of the box like it's popcorn. Uh, but no, it's uh, the film is great. It is so great. And Reitman is so good, uh, has created something so good and just unleashes the cast to go go be funny. Uh, and they all do a great job. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much again. Um, sell your wares. Where? How can uh, people connect with you? I didn't do it. Um, I'm at Mind Reels on... X, formerly known as Twitter, if we still do that. Um, I'm, uh, it's Twix, baby. Call it Twix. Right, Twix. Ooh, now I'm hungry. Um, TheMindReels.com is the website. Um, we do have YouTube stuff. It's been forever since we posted anything. I'm trying to find a new way in. But uh, yeah, and if you're into the Universal Monsters, that's kind of where I am right now, watching a whole bunch of stuff for uh, for Halloween. Good times, good times. And as always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the editor and publisher over at In the Seats, in the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest in the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large. You know, we post a lot. We post frequently when I am motivated and able and doing God knows what else. But also, uh, I am the host and, per and uh, producer of our companion podcast called In the Seats With, where I sit down with a wide ranging variety of entertainment industry professionals and pick their brain by current projects, state of the industry how they got started, and so very much more in light and conversational fashion. And that's available on all podcast platforms as well as our YouTube channel. So go hit like and subscribe and push your notification buttons on all that fun stuff because it, it matters and we really do appreciate it. Got to smash that subscribe button, as they say. It's not, you don't hit it, you smash it. You smash it. Smash that subscribe button. Um. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you both. And of course... For us, you can find us uh, screenfish.net, where we have uh, the reviews of the latest in pop culture and film and current new releases and, you know, film festival coverage. And as much as we can, you can follow us on Instagram at at screenfish online <laughs> and uh, also on TikTok. And you can find us on X as well, um, but certainly Give us and, and of course, follow us on YouTube and wherever podcasts are available, where we have interviews with uh, lots of industry professionals as well who are covering their new pro or their new their latest uh, offerings in the world of pop culture and uh, more phenomenal conversations with incredible guests just like this with Screenfish Radio as well. Um, so, yes, once again, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here and for you at home. We started the conversation. This was Screenfish. Word salad, word salad, word salad, word salad, word salad. <laughs> <laughs>